I am Sean Ryu. Uh, I'm a senior architect and front-end developer at Therefore. Um, Therefore is a digital agency based in Toronto, um, and we specialize in building enterprise communication systems using open source web technologies, so Drupal, uh, and of course, a whole bunch of other things. Uh, okay, so what I do. Uh, so generally speaking, I work with clients to establish strong information architecture and content strategy for their CMS projects. Uh, so information architecture, Drupal, we look at planning content types, you know, planning the site architecture in general. Um, I also work with front-end technologies to build accessible websites and web applications. Um, so whether that's using Drupal um, or using other technologies like Angular. Um, and I also uh, engage with clients through a process of discovery uh, to determine the best content strategy for their business and user needs. So that's working with uh, designers and, and uh, other developers and the, and the client to figure out um, you know, the best content strategy and digital strategy for their needs. Uh, okay, so I mean, what I'll be talking about today is uh, decoupled Drupal. Um, I'm going to go through a quick primer on it, just in case you're not familiar with the idea, although I'm sure a lot of you are. Um, actually, does anybody, does any, everyone in the room know what decoupled Drupal is, basically? I'll, I'll give a primer. This is a primer. I just wanted to see, you know, familiarity's sake. Um, okay, so uh, generally Drupal sold as a standalone solution, so it's a one-size-fits-all website front-end data store content management interface. Um, this is, you know, very familiar to uh, clients. We have stuff like WordPress that also serves the same purpose. Um, so our presentation layer and our content management is all just one pile. Uh, so in Drupal 8, uh, we've got some new sexiness coming. Uh, we have RESTful Web Services, um, which maybe doesn't sound sexy, but it is. Um, we have uh, HTTP basic authentication and serialization uh, modules built into core of Drupal 8. So what this means is, um, out of the box, we can build an API with Drupal, a REST API, a RESTful endpoint. Um, we can provide authentication, so we can post content, we can retrieve content in a secure way, um, and serialization. Uh, we can basically um, serve JSON um, or pull in JSON. So uh, decoupled, um, this is actually a computer science term, not just a Drupal buzzword. Um, it de basically decoupling provides us with a separation of concerns. Um, so separation of concern design um, seeks to uh, encapsulate our code or data into component functionality uh, with defined interfaces. So you might be thinking Drupal modules sort of offer this, but it's kind of unidirectional with Drupal because everything is just for Drupal. It's not really encapsulated in a grander sense. Uh, so decouple Drupal. Um, so Drupal can serve as an API to allow us to separate our presentation layer, our content creation uh, layer, um, and, uh, and the content model uh, from, from each other, potentially. Um, so we can create, uh, you know, we can separate the Drupal theming layer from, from the content behind it. So we can look at Drupal as a, a content modeling service. We can look at Drupal as content management and API. Um, so there's a few different models for this. Um, so, you know, we have situations where we might look at Drupal as a content management interface and an API uh, with many endpoints. So an example of that would be we have Drupal, which is being used to uh, create content and manage content, but then we have m multiple, uh, one or many endpoints, uh, such as, um, you know, maybe an Angular application or a native app, um, which pulls in content from Drupal. Um, we could also have a model where Drupal is an, ADI, an API and data store um, and a tool for data modeling, but isn't used for content management. So on this, uh, in this case, you might have an Angular app which could um, you know, post content to uh, the Drupal data store and retrieve and display content from the Drupal data store, in which case Drupal is just an API. The client never even needs to see it. And then um, we can also look at Drupal potentially as an API to API interface. So um, very often, there's benefits to a MySQL-based um, database schema uh, versus like a NoSQL thing, which you might be using if you're using, creating like a, a Mongo app. Um, so you know, if you have a sort of joint needs for um, two different types of data store in an application, Drupal might be that API to act as a bit of a middleware um, to, to you know, pull and push content um, to, from different sources. Um, so is that kind of clear to everybody, that whole idea of decoupled Drupal? 
Um, okay, so why is it exciting um, to us as developers and designers and digital strategists? So developers, um, so generally speaking, you know, developers are excited about new technologies when they get to work with them. So, uh, you know, there's new technologies like Angular and Re React and Famous, uh, which lean heavy into to JavaScript, um, which we want to take advantage of. Um, Drupal doesn't always opt for that directly. Um, so another reason developers like this sort of decoupled model is when we separate our concerns, um, it allows us to focus our efforts in a more distributed way. So that means that you can have front-end developers and back-end developers working on different parts of the project. Um, so say you have like a mock API for your data model. Back-end developers can work on building the API. Front-end developers can work on building the front-end without really running into each other, which is nice. Um, it also allows, as web developers, it allows us to focus on sort of the fundamentals, the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, which is usually either what the user engages with, um, well, generally, exactly what the user engages with. Um, whereas with Drupal, you know, sometimes we get caught up in database queries or PHP. Um, and then we also, as backend developers, we get to focus on APIs and integrations, which is, you know, kind of the meat and potatoes of, of backend. Um, you know, server-side stuff's obviously a big part of that, but, um, you know, the APIs and integrations is kind of the exciting back-end work. So designers. Designers can like this, too. Uh, so, um, I mean, I, I had a sort of an overarching um, theme here that designers and developers can like this together because designers don't get as many no's from developers. Um, so part of this is about the flexibility that a decoupled model can offer um, developers and designers. So. Uh, you know, we can move beyond the page-centric model of building websites. So, you know, generally speaking, a Drupal website is a bunch of pages. It's a bunch of routes, and each page reloads. Um, but we can, a designer can start thinking about more challenging, uh, like more, more application-like or dynamic models. So, um, you know, states and transitions become just as important as what the page looks like. Um, you know, user interface design shouldn't be about skinning or theming. Right? We, want to, we want to break that, um, that paradigm completely, and we want to think about human behavior and the actual needs of a project. And uh, another thing developers might like about this model is um, there's less time between that design and sort of the initial front-end prototypes. So um, you know, it's easier to get a, um, a front-end built when you're not having to worry about Drupalisms. It's basically as simple as that. Um, and then digital strategists. Digital strategists might also like this model because um, it allows us to focus on the content data model um, instead of, you know, sort of getting caught up in Drupalisms um, and Drupal content types. Um, often if we're architecting for a Drupal site, we're thinking, what module am I going to use for this field? What module am I going to use for this front-end component? This just lets us think about the data model in kind of a more, um, you know, platform agnostic sense. Um, so it also offers this you know, sort of idea of a component-based architecture. So um, you know, generally, we're able to isolate things that we build a little bit better um, because, again, we're not thinking about how it impacts the Drupal site as a whole. We can build you know, a component over here, a component over there um, for various content types or displays or features, um, and which offers better scalability because we can sort of add things um, in a more distributed way. And um, also digital strategists like this because we can focus on the, the business logic, uh, not the limitations of the framework. So with Drupal, sometimes we get caught up in, well, what can we do with Drupal? Can we, you know, should we use this module? Should we use that module? Um, ideally, we're just focused on the business logic. Clients would prefer that most likely. Um, telling them that you're going to activate a module doesn't really make you sound all that valuable. Um, telling them you're going to solve their business problems um, is a good way to present value. Um, okay, so um, so now we know why the developers, designers, why we as as agencies or um, you know uh, developers um, enjoy this model or are excited about a model like this. So um, let's 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 start thinking about how um, you know we can start uh, cultivating the right kind of clients for this model. Um, so while you're browsing RFPs, um, some things that you might want to take note of uh, in terms of spotting the right client. So uh, we generally, for this kind of project, you want a client to be unbiased. So what this means is they know what they need, but not what they want, necessarily. Sometimes you might get an RFP that says, we want a Drupal site. Fair enough. Um, but if a client comes to you and they're very focused on you know, individual needs that they have, then OK, now we can experiment. We can look at um, you know, applying the right solution without just applying the solution they asked for. 
Um, so another good thing to, to try to spot for is uh, distributed organizational structure. So um, certain organizations are going to have really distributed structures. Uh, we work with a lot of unions. Unions have a tendency to have regional offices, um, national offices, and also Quebec offices. They have locals. They have you know, basically a very distributed model for their organization, and there's actually a really strict governance model in the way it all comes together. So um, you know, organiza organizations like that um, work really well for this sort of decoupled model uh, because we can centralize content management and content distribution while having you know, multiple front end um, endpoints uh, to, to actually represent all these satellite offices. Um, so a client with good long-term thinking. So sometimes clients just want a website, they want it in three months. Um, sometimes clients, they want a website in three months, but they're also thinking about their long-term initiatives. They want to build an app at some point. They want to, um, you know, they want their content in multiple places. Um, so long-term thinking is critical because that will help them to understand uh, the model. Um, so we also have to ensure that our clients are technical enough. So basically, if you have a client that references the idea of API integrations in their RFP, they may actually be more receptive to this kind of model because they already understand this idea and value behind um, integration. Um, and then another critical thing, um, you know, this is like if you work in Agile, this is always sort of critical, but um, you know, not every client is receptive to it. Um, we want to be able to work really closely with our clients to build strong data models. So the idea with decoupled Drupal is that we're more focused on building this, the data model and ensuring it's rich. Um, we can't do that if we can't get access to the client. Um, okay, so uh, the right project. So another thing from these RFPs. Uh, so some things, just high level stuff that we can, we can spot that um, may actually be a, a good trigger. So publishing workflow, um, if there's a big emphasis on publishing workflow, uh, decoupled site may, might make a lot of sense. Um, and the reason for that is, is that uh, we can actually focus our efforts on Drupal as just a content management interface. We're not worried about the view-centric components of building a Drupal site. We're just worried about like, modeling um, you know, a really good uh, publishing workflow and a really good content model. Um, so projects with multiple integrations, again, if the client's referencing APIs, they probably get it. Um, then data complexity. So, you know, when we have highly structured data, really complicated data sets, not just blogs and articles, um, you know, it, it really makes sense to start thinking about an API early on um, because there's probably a lot of different ways that that content's going to be displayed. Um, and if we're just simply creating different display suite view modes, um, it's not really answering the call of the, of the, uh, the data. Um, and then another concern, if the client is looking to scale, like straight up, they just know that they're going to be scaling their project, then, um, and the, the project that they're working on is part of a bigger picture, then it probably makes sense to consider this kind of model. Um, okay, so you know, we took a look at some things that we might try to spot in an RFP. Um, so we're writing our proposal. Um, and you know, at this stage, we're basically, we're trying to convince the client that we have the expertise and the know-how to deliver their product. Not necessarily going to get really specific about um, solutions, but we want to start thinking about what we're actually going to do for them and, uh, and sell them that expertise in the right way. Um, so some key points uh, that we can use to, to sell this kind of model. Um, so you know, sell, say we're going at them with a RESTful web service built in Drupal 8. Um, you know, here's some, some value points. You know, a well-structured API allows for greater data portability and interop uh, interoperability. So you know, clients are always concerned about their data being locked into an ecosystem. They're also concerned about times in the past where they've gotten burned by having all of their data in a site that just sucks, and then they can't get it out, and they have to rebuild it every five years. API offers data portability because fundamentally you have a model that's built on REST, which you know, basically is designed to allow content to come in and out. Um, so you know, another key value point, um, having an API that lives at their digital, the center of their digital ecosystem. A lot of clients are going to have these dis weird distributed systems where they have a CRM over here, and they have, um, you know, they have uh, three websites, and they have you know, an intranet. Um, you know, the, the idea of an API uh, may lead to this idea of a more centralized ecosystem for their data. Because um, an API doesn't always have to be public facing data, right? It's just a mechanism for pulling in data from different sources. Um, and interacting with it and serving it up. Um, so, and, and on that topic, you know, this, this whole idea opens up avenues for their content to be distributed. So, you know, a lot of clients will get excited about the idea of, um, you know, building a native app um, or, you know, building um, 
you know, multiple websites off of one platform. Like this actually comes up a lot for us. So you know, that's that's a big value add um, to to approach things through a RESTful model. Um, so uh, you know, selling Drupal. Obviously, like you know, we're at a Drupal conference, um, so we're all interested in that. Um, you know, why is Drupal the right solution to this kind of model? Uh, Drupal offers you know arguably the best open source content management solution. Um, with uh, you know, we've got solutions for internationalization, advanced user hierarchies, content moderation workflows. Um, you know, all of these things um, are you know content management centric, and um, you know. Uh, they're fairly advanced, so out of the box we get a lot of functionality. Um, and then, um, you know, with the decoupled model uh, with content management for Drupal, um, you know, we can we can actually securely hide that from public access, which is actually value add for a lot of clients. Drupal sites get hacked. Uh, that happened a lot last year. If you didn't know that, you probably have a bunch of hacked Drupal sites that you haven't <laughs> been dealing with. So um, <laughs> everybody laughed because everybody dealt with that last year. Um, yeah, so you know the, the nice thing about this decoupled model is we can sell clients on this sort of walled garden for their content. The gardens or the content is hidden back there, and th you know we don't have to worry about anyone um, you know hitting it or hitting an open PHP form and uh, taking their site down. So um, and we also have uh, you know the, the, the value that uh, we ha um, content can be sourced from other REST endpoints or other endpoints in general. And then the moderation workflows can allow that API to act as a content aggregator. So aggregation is always something that um, clients want, but we're still delivering XML feeds. Um, you know, um, the, the REST model uh, offers something a lot more robust, and uh, you know, Drupal is a great place to bring that data in and moderate it. Um, okay, so and you know another great solution to offer to our clients is um, you know this whole idea of decoupled front end and using modern frameworks. So um, you know a big thing is uh, updating a Drupal site is really costly. Generally, we scrap it, build a new one. I mean, how many upgrades from Drupal five would you do? No, you wouldn't. You would find a way to get the data out. You would and build a new website. So um, with this, it's different because the data model maybe doesn't expire nearly as frequently. Um, and we can update the front end without really the concern for the back end. Um, so it we also offer um, more dynamic app-like app -like user experiences um, and interfaces. So you know, UX isn't a buzzword. You know, it's fundamentally about solving actual human problems. Um, that's hard to do when you're locked into you know, an assortment of Drupal contrib modules that have most likely been designed for like, one very narrow purpose. Uh, we want to build the right kind of solution. So um, you know, using modern frameworks can offer that. Um, the possibility of mobile applications, again, that's a big thing for clients. Um, and it, like, if, if you look at um, organizations in the education sector, you know, they're all considering ways that they can uh, improve their uh, information ecosystem to include apps. Um, you know, modern frameworks like Ionic, um, React Native um, are getting there to a really um, strong degree. Um, and then also, you know, we're looking at uh, potentially mixing of static and dynamic content um, by using modern frameworks. Uh, so we can, you know, we can ensure performance and engagement um, through a combination, uh, like a, a multi-tiered approach for how we're, we're d displaying content, um, which is a lot harder to achieve in Drupal with just caching. Um, and then, uh, you know, the greater scalability, um, you know, we can add new endpoints with still maintaining one API. Uh, okay, so um, you know, obviously, a big part of what we sell, like for in the, if we're in the Drupal business in general, um, is this idea of open source technology. Um, so you know, um, continuing to sell Drupal means continuing to sell Drupal as a pillar of um, you know enterprise ready open source, and uh, you know, we only enhance that reputation by actually looking to other open source technologies um, and other open source ecosystems. So, sort of broadening the scope of what um, Drupal is involved in and integrated with. Um, and you know another another thing about the the open source cell is you know clients don't want to be locked into a proprietary system. Um, you know we, we're offering them ways to get their data out, and we're also offering them the open source technology they can take over um, should they get sick of us. Um, okay, so uh, the other another you know big part of this um, is the process, and our process changes when we look at a decoupled model. Um, becomes a bit more like the process may be for you know other people in the industry. So you know a, a decoupled model allows us to better focus on solving content modeling problems and not site building problems. Um, 
So what that means is, you know, traditionally with Drupal, we pick the modules before we pick how the content should be modeled or how the site should work, um, which is a bad thing. Um, so you know, we want to focus on user flows, wireframes, uh, you know, site maps, which you're probably doing with Drupal anyways. But the problem is you're always, in the back of your mind, you're always thinking, we're going to build this in Drupal, so we need to think about certain things. You don't want to do that. You want to build the right thing, right? You want to focus on the technology that will solve the problem identified by your user flow, personas, wireframes, et cetera. Um, and you know exactly what, what is listed here, basically. We can uncover the most meaningful interaction and experience um, to suit the business goals and needs. Um, without being stuck just in Drupalisms. Um, so another part of process, I touched on this earlier, parallel development and tighter feedback loops. Um, so once initial discovery and design begins, um, the data layer and presentation layer can develop in parallel. So that means faster tangible results for the clients. Um, you know, they can see that front end before it really does anything, which is actually quite useful. Uh, and it makes f clients feel that things are progressing versus if you show them a completed, unthemed Drupal website that they can click through. That means nothing to them. They hate that. Uh, <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> With, so, uh, you know, and then, um, you know, basically, because we have um, effective visual prototypes being built ahead of backend functionality, we can tighten our feedback loops, um, especially with user testing. Um, you know, very often, we don't want a user to see the website until it's done, because it, they'll be confused, right? You show them an unthemed website and tell them to find information, um, it's meaningless to them. So ideally, you know, those prototypes give us an earlier trajectory for bringing in user testing and user feedback. There we go. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, OK, I see. I guess I'm talking too much between the slides. Uh, OK, so um, another, another part of the process, um, you know, once we've finished building something, um, the nice thing about a decoupled model is, uh, you know, the model is, has a greater long-term viability. So, you know, we've built them. Um, a, even, if, even if the API becomes redundant, we still establish the data model. And because it's something that's structured in, in maybe JSON uh, or something similar to that, um, then, you know, we understand, uh, we have a you know, really easy way to get the data out, and we get a, have a really easy way to get the data model out. It's not a Drupal MySQL database. Um, right, so that's, uh, you know, the viability of the data model is, is a strong thing, but also the API can live longer because the front end isn't really paired to it. Fancy technology. Uh, okay, so a separation of concerns also means um, that um, support and maintenance can come at a lower risk. You know, if we have a, uh, a Drupal front end that's built in um, Angular, we can focus on fixing issues in the Angular app, not in the API, depending on where the issues actually lie. It's probably just because I'm wandering and it's like tugging at the uh, bundle of cables here. I'll just stay closer. Um, okay, so uh, the, other, the other component in all this is, is working with the right people, so, um, which is another thing we're selling our clients and, um, you know, it's critical to us. So one of the problems with Drupal is a Drupal dev is it's kind of a narrow focus, whereas meanwhile the rest of the digital, um, you know, the industry around digital has kind of evolved these new roles that, you know, ideally we're all sort of stepping into. Uh, we don't want to be Drupal devs. We want to be content strategists. We want to be developers, maybe JavaScript developers. Uh, we want to be product designers, data analysts. So, you know, with, when you're looking at a decoupled model, it allows us to be a bit more agnostic about the system we're working in. We're not just delivering Drupal results. We're engaging in the entire you know, digital agency process, um, which is a little bit harder to do when you're just focused on Drupal because you get stuck on Drupal problems. Um, okay, so um, you know, I've gone over you know, what I see as some of the benefits, the ways we can sell it to clients. So um, here's just some questions that have maybe come up um, you know, in, in when we've talked to clients about this kind of thing. Um, and uh, you know, that may just be things you're wondering um, yourselves. So, uh, we have a client that's familiar with Drupal. Um, so they have expectations about what a Drupal site is, how it works, what it looks like. So how do we manage that um, in a decoupled system? So, um, you know, uh, familiarity with Drupal likely means a familiarity, familiarity with the drawbacks and the benefits. Um, so, you know, we know the pain points that we always hear. You know, we had a Drupal site and it was slow. We had a Drupal site we couldn't upgrade. Um, we had a Drupal site that got hacked. Um, you know, so 
Uh, while we don't want to focus on the drawbacks, we don't want to like go to our client and tell them that Drupal sucks and these are the reasons, um, <laughs> we want to focus on applying, the, the, the real key is focusing on applying the right solutions. So we want to identify tangible solutions and if it makes sense to use Drupal, then we use Drupal um, versus just deciding that Drupal is the de facto solution for everything. Um, so you know, the idea is to look at Drupal as a, um, part of a suite of solutions that we can offer. Um, it isn't, and then acknowledging to clients that it isn't the best solution for everything. Um, and you know, the, it, providing that kind of transparency um, about a tool that you, you may love working with is, is a positive, because uh, clients, it's a good way for us to encourage clients to try different things. Um, okay, so um, you know, this is a big thing with decoupled. There's big concerns that you know, we have clients that want to be able to edit in place, because they saw that at a Acquia demo. Um, they they want to be able to adjust layouts and add widgets to pages. They want their changes to appear as soon as they've made them. They don't care about publishing workflow. Um, so you know, Drupal Contrib offer, offers all kinds of awesome site building tools, um, and you know, sometimes we expose that to clients, but we all know the cost. You know, we go back to Drupal sites we've built from years past um, with really open architectures, and they look terrible because the client has you know put all sorts of weird. HTML in the page, they have embeds from all these weird sources, um, you know, basically they ruin what at the beginning may have been a well-designed site. Um, and then another issue, you have clients who are constantly clearing caches, they're constantly, you know, they want to see instant results, um, or they're, you know, they're insistent that their site be basically uncached because they're constantly updating information. Then you end up with this ridiculously unperformant site, right? So, I mean, you know, it's kind of a counter argument to the whole, hey, I should be able to publish content and it appears right away. Well, you shouldn't. There isn't a digital ecosystem on the face of the planet that accepts that as a, as a reality, unless they're built on like, you know, serious next gen real time technology, which Drupal isn't. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, an, there's any number of ways uh, to architect, you know, view centric solutions in a Drupal um, decoupled system. So what I mean here is not Drupal views, I mean like view centric as in, um, you know, when we're, when we're coming up with our data model, um, you know, in Drupal, sometimes in a content type, we'll put all kinds of toggles and switches that will decide how that content is displayed. Um, you know, panels is a good example of this. We have a node, and then that node has a bunch of widgets associated to it as a panel entity. Um, so that's, that's where we start to get into this like view-centric content modeling. Our data model includes things about how it's displayed. In a decoupled model, we want to completely avoid that, um, or at least avoid it in the central data model. So, you know, the point is here is, you know, we want to sell our clients on the idea, the value of the data model um, over, you know, and, and also the value of our design thinking as design specialists and UX specialists, um, not just selling them on this idea that we can just activate modules and they're going to get something for free. Um, and then, you know, the other side of this is the idea of a managed editorial workflow. Um, if clients want their content to suddenly appear, you know, it's, I mean, there's a lot of risk to that, right? They can make changes that can break their site, you know, especially if you've given them a lot of control. So, you know, there's a reason that we as developers, we use things like Git for version control and quick revision and stuff like continuous, uh, continuous integration for our development projects. You know, getting a client to think on that level is, uh, is a positive. Um, and also, I mean, you know, if we're working with organizations that don't have a traditional publishing background, and they're just sort of in this communication sphere, you know, they, their whole mindset is, well, Drupal offers the ability to publish content anytime I want. But um, if you actually work in, like, for publishing companies, it's not how, not how actual real publishing works. There's an editorial workflow. People contribute content. Someone decides when it goes live. It's scheduled to go live. It's not just save and then it's live. So um, you know, getting them to think about a real editorial workflow is, um, is a positive and a good way to sort of sell um, counterpoints. Uh, okay, so the third one. Um, this is probably the most contentious one. Uh, the client is technical. They get the whole model. They get the IPI, they get the front end and the framework. They don't get Drupal though. They're experienced, they're technical. Why PHP? Why MySQL? Um, so, you know, we're used to justifying Drupal as this complete solution. Um, but this whole idea of decoupling forces us to look at Drupal more objectively, which I think is a positive. Um, so, you know, we want to stop and think, is Drupal actually the right solution? Um, and we have to be, you know, um, accepting of the fact that sometimes it's not. And by accepting a decoupled model, at times we're not going to be building Drupal sites. In fact, we'll avoid them because it's not right for the project. Um, you know, so as digital agencies, we're used to this idea of building elaborate systems with Drupal, um, which is really empowering, but it can also be a crutch. Um, you know, we often don't take responsibility for the modules we use. 
Um, and, uh, you know, and, and very often we're, you know, creating functionality that maybe it, it solves the, the need that the client was requesting, but it doesn't actually do it well, which is a problem. So the question is, are we in the business of providing the right solutions to clients um, and their needs, or are we simply in the business of selling Drupal? Um, I like to think that, you know, a lot of us here want to sell the right solutions to clients. Um, you know, so that, again, the, the decoupled model forces us to question our underlying assumptions about our technology, which is always good. We should always be questioning what we're using. Um, as Drupal 8 evolves into this platform uh, that can su um, support decoupled models, uh, we have to continue to justify its place. So that's as contributors, as people coming to speak at Drupal Camp, um, we have to continue to explain why Drupal still matters in this, you know, this decoupled um, or component-based uh, architectures, scalable architectures. Um, so, you know, in this specific case, when the client asks the question, the client might be right, and we have to be ready to accept that and provide them an alternative to Drupal if necessary. Now, obviously, this is if we're getting into this territory of decoupled Drupal. If not, you know, fair enough, you're selling Drupal sites. But, you know, part of the, if, if we're modernizing our workflows, we're looking at new technologies, at a certain point, we may have to accept that Drupal is not going to be the center of our business, which is okay. Okay, so that's uh, basically it. So if anybody has any questions or further challenges, it looks like we have some. So your last slide was talking about how, yeah, you have to accept the Drupal development, but isn't Drupal really good at modeling content? For sure. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the core strengths. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm, not I'm not suggesting that. I'm just preparing us for the reality that occasionally you will say that. You don't have to sell it every time, right? I 100% agree, and that's exactly how we approach it with clients, right? We are selling clients the idea of Drupal as industry class, enterprise, content management, and you know, with Drupal 8, we have this really strong intelligent API. So I'm 100% behind that. It's just part of decoupling. It means that we have to actually fundamentally look at you know, solving problems in this sort of com component-based way, right? Where here's, here's a solution, here's a solution, here's a solution. Now we have to assess which ones are the right for the right solutions for a given client. Um, and you know, it might be uncomfortable for us because we're used to just saying, well, Drupal, obviously, um, but you know, is that best for your clients? Maybe not. Yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. Hi, oh um, sorry. I, I, it kind of makes me think of uh, selling any other good practice. Like, uh, I'd like to sell, uh, for example, uh, automated testing to my clients. And mm -hmm. I've often done that successfully. But in some, in some cases, uh, my clients like not getting the idea of automated testing, not understanding why I'm spending so much time. Right. On it. And I, I kind of got to a point after a few years where I just do it anyway. Yeah. Like, it kind of just becomes this best practice that, like, you know, I'm going to do it, and I'll, I'll explain later. For sure. I'm wondering if you think that, uh, like, in the case of, is there any case where you would not use decoupled Drupal, having done it now? For a lot of clients, is there any case where you'd say, no, this, for this project, it's not good, or has it become kind of a de facto? Best oh, definitely not, right? I mean, again, it's a lot of clients are coming to the table with a bias, right? That's why we have this point on like the unbiased, um, you know, client is, you know, basically a lot of clients they have a bias. They want Drupal, uh, especially government clients, unions, like anyone basically, um, you know, kind of bridging on public sector is going to already know about Drupal. There's like a government mandate to use it. There's a government distro for Drupal. So, I mean, you know, there's these mandates to do it. And sometimes that's, you're just going to obviously accept what the client wants and do the project because it's good value to you and it's what they want. Um, I mean, I think like it's not always the case that you're going to have to actually sell them on the model. Sometimes you're just going to do it because the client doesn't know what they want. You know, is it important for the client to know that their technology, what the underlying technology is? Yes. But you know, if you're presenting yourself as the expert, you're helping them decide that technology, right? So, and like what you're saying in terms of automated testing, you know, you might list that as a bullet point of what you've offered them and charged them, but you're doing it to protect yourself and you're doing it to make your work um, higher quality, right? And it's the same thing with decoupled Drupal. If we're using it as like the right solution, it's not because we're just specifically trying to convince the client to use it because we want to do it. It's because we actually believe that it's a good solution. Yeah, had a question? Yeah, so follow on to that question. So yeah two really good slides on like what the right client is for Drupal or for decoupled or headless Drupal and like what how do you recognize the RFP that's going to like lead you down that direction. Mm -hmm. I didn't see a, a, a bullet point in there about like budget, but it was kind of the underlying theme of a lot of those things. And my yeah. impression is that for a headless Drupal project it makes sense. 
be a big project. Yeah, so I mean, I think there's, there's two sides of that. Um, I think like, you know, so we're Drupal developers, so we have an established suite of things that we use, right? So um, we have in-house distributions, we have uh, modules that we've contributed, and, or we just have modules that we like using, or other people's distros that we like using. These are efficiencies that let us build faster um, and cheaper for us for, at higher profits. Or we can accept smaller projects and still profit from them because we know how to do them faster. Um, I mean, I think like the, the evolution of a decoupled model is the same thing. Um, we want to be able to offer client, we want to be able to have in-house the tools necessary to build a decoupled Drupal site faster than we could build a normal Drupal site. And then that's a, a benefit for us. And I think that's actually the reality long term. Um, but I think if you're just selling it to a client and they're absorbing all the costs, yes, it's likely higher. Angelo, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tried to be clever. That sorry, I apologize. That's fine. Um, you would mentioned that um, for situations where the client is like, yeah, we want our content to appear like that, yeah. and we want our site to be super fast, um, you said that, sorry, you have to go one way or the other? Not necessarily, but sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, that yeah. there are ways, if, if the client does have a large enough budget, and uh, you do <laughs> But not through hardware, um, through software. Uh, we've had success with Varnish, um, and our requirement was, yeah, we want our, our you know, content to appear ASAP as soon as we save. Right. Um, but we want it to be speedy. Yeah, through Varnish you can do that. Um, unfortunately, some hosts don't provide Varnish on their servers. So yeah. That kind of sucks. You might have to host in-house, which is going to increase your cost. Yep. So long as the client is willing to accept those costs, hey. Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely, like, obviously, like, caching is part of a performance strategy, um, but there's sort of a fundamental difference, right? You can also put caching on a static site, and it's still going to be way faster than anything you built in Drupal. Mm -hmm. Because the problem with caching is, you know, it relies on caching pages that people are going to. Um, yeah. So, I mean, one of the nice things about stuff like, uh, you know, NoSQL-based databases is because they're document-based, they're pretty fast, right? So you look at something, um, a good example of this is, um, so uh, Craigslist, they actually have a two-sided model. They're, they have two different database models uh, for, for their service. Um, they have MySQL for all the transactional stuff. Or, and, um, and then uh, they have a Mongo database, which just stores long-term data, which seems like kind of the opposite of what most people talk about. But um, so because uh, the, the, the NoSQL database um, is actually smaller, and it actually, because it's document-based, it's more efficient and fast for like long-term results and archive results, whereas like the MySQL model um, is, you know, handles all the transactional stuff. So, I mean, it's just like there they've actually decoupled their own system, right? They have two different databases serving the same platform. I mean, there's a lot of value in, in looking at those kind of models. The problem with Drupal is, you know, the only thing you can do is rely on the caching or you have to bring in like kind of decoupled elements into a Drupal site like where you're bringing in hard. or static site content, you know, not relying on Drupal bootstrap to like present your content, you know. But again, at a certain point, you throw away the Drupal theming layer, and you start feeding Drupal data into something that is designed to be quicker and present data in um, more performant ways. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, no, there is, there is caching, for sure. Okay. So how does all of Drupal has a very special sort of database model where everything works with joins, right? Yeah. Uh, it's very special to Drupal, how, how Drupal works. And a lot of uh, performance stuff is uh, they can complain about this, and they say, well, we want to Something else for this particular. What, what would you suggest people do in such a case where you don't get to use the then all the content curating models and everything because you're not using the same database structure? 
Well, I mean, in the case I was just pointing out here, it's kind of, you know, where a two-tiered approach where we have different database models for, you know, different solutions. Um, like, just in a simple decoupled site, you don't have to have a secondary database model, right? Drupal is the API that's serving the content. So you have an endpoint, which is potentially cached, um, and then, you know, the, the, you have some sort of, you know, uh, data store, um, which, like, really just, you know, brings data in when it's required, and then you have, um, you know, your front end. So you have like Angular that's, you know, hitting something like JS data to, you know, pull in its content or pulling content from the Drupal site. So, I mean, fundamentally, there's never another database model. It's still just Drupal. So if you need to do those kind of complex queries, like relational queries, you still can. It's, there's no reason you wouldn't. Um, your API just needs to be able to, like, you know, obviously pull in those kind of queries. Mind if I comment on that? Uh, yeah, you're, you're referring to field safety and the field API. So you have five or six fields, you query a full node, you need five or six joins, that kind of stuff. Um, if you're willing to put the effort into it, you can use the entity API and create your own entity. So literally all your fields are essentially one table. Things do tend to go a little bit faster, but it does require some manual work on your end. Any, any other questions? Yeah. All right. So one of the selling points, you touch in caching, mm -hmm. but one of the selling points Yeah. So you can cache the API mm -hmm. as well as the front end with the standard varnish cache. Yeah. And that makes a big difference. For sure, yeah. And you can have layers of that, right? I mean, if you're using, uh, I think, you know, like, obviously, you can, you can, if you're using, like, some sort of views em based endpoint, you can cache the view, you can, so you can cache the query, you can do the varnish cache, you can do memcache, you can do, it's just, the list goes on. Just on the uh, RFP, which everyone can takes that process, um, when you're looking at an RFP, I typically don't directly uh, respond with a decoupled solution explicitly unless the questions lead towards that. So unless the person who wrote that RFP actually knows what they're talking about and will actually appreciate that angle. Mm -hmm. So I keep it more general. Technical enough, right? Yeah, and, then, and the conversation about like, should we decouple, should we not decouple, should we have some sort of a a mix between that, do we have a static site generator, whatever, right? That conversation and that whole thought process is, is way too premature. Yeah. You're just looking at right. Our, well, this is why, like, our, you know, that needs to be pushed off. The big thing here is, you know, we want to focus on, like, our strategy up front, right? And then the technical solutions should be informed by the strategy. If you're going at a client just saying, we're going to build you a Drupal site. Now let's do content strategy. Let's do digital strategy now. It's like, well, you've already moved beyond digital strategy. You decided you're using Drupal. So, you know, the, I agree. Like, I think it's important to make sure you know what you're, um, you know, know what you're, they, they really need. Yeah, exactly. Uh, any other questions? Oh, over here. Right. Um, we recently did a uh, sort of like a reverse proxy for Facebook sharing, so some PHP code which is going to direct you to um, the, the specific node on the Drupal side right. so that the Facebook tracker can come and just get that information. Right. Have you ever come to that problem? Have you ever tried to solve it? So the, when, when any, ever, anything like SEO related or share related comes up, uh, you know, I mean, there are pre-renderers for, you know, stuff like Angular. Um, you know, I think long term, you're probably going to see a lot more like a decoupled site isn't just the front end framework. There's actually like, it's an isomorphic application where there's like, you know, a data store on the Angular side or on, on the JavaScript side that's actually handling um, sort of this like post um, content management serving. Um, so I think, like, you know, probably long term, like, a lot of those kind of issues are going to be more, like, in the JavaScript side than on, than on the Drupal side. I mean, it's, ideally, the Drupal does, like, is, is, is agnostic to the display layer as, as necessary, right? So, um, you know, pushing people back to your Drupal site because there's deficiencies in your Angular application probably isn't the best long term strategy, but 
Angular has all kinds of holes, right? Like, you know, uh, very often people get excited about it and then they're not thinking about SEO and they launch a website and Google can barely crawl it because they haven't provisioned it properly. So um, obviously there's challenges, but, um, you know, I mean, if that's anything new, right? I mean, I think, you know, that the fact that Google is kind of the central force behind stuff like Polymer and, and Angular, where they're sort of, I mean, especially something like Polymer, where it is kind of in itself this decoupled, you know, component-based model, um, I think it makes sense that a lot of those problems are going to be solved, like, you know, or have probably already been solved, right? But that's on the, on the Angular side. There have been posts recently about making hybrid applications mm -hmm. or stuff like that. But yep. at the end, you know, you're kind of uh, loading up the bootstrap from, right. from your Drupal, because you have some Drupal components. So. Yeah, avoiding bootstrapping Drupal seems to be kind of one of the main, um, the main threads uh, with any of those. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, shy of like having, you know, there be a, a completely second thread of Drupal that kind of <laughs> lightens up that bootstrap. Um, yeah, I think, uh, like, I think most decoupled projects probably benefit from um, considering, you know, a secondary database sage or like an API, like outside of just the Drupal API to like, so you're not just bootstrapping Drupal every single time you want to do a query. But I mean, like, um, this, uh, this guy was saying over here, like, you know, caching can help to at least mitigate some of your API performance issues. Um, so, you know, you're bootstrapping Drupal, or, or like with a hybrid solution, like you're still bootstrapping Drupal, but at least it's cached. Um, so, uh, it was one of the first things that we were talking about, uh, or that I mentioned, was just sort of like the different models. Um, so, we're actually working internally on a, on a project that kind of touches on this. Um, uh, and, and basically, the idea is to completely uh, decouple this whole interface, um, but as part, as a component-based um, uh, interface um, for your front end. So, um, the idea is on your front end, you're going to have, you know, components. Um, maybe you looked at those as like content types or widgets or whatever the hell you want to look at them as. Um, and then, um, you know, you, you need to um, edit or create those. Um, so the idea is to actually put that directly in the front end um, and then bypass Drupal's content management altogether. Um, so we'd be building a content management interface that's easily integratable into whatever front end we want to build. Um, yeah, so um, I, like we haven't we haven't gotten too deep into that, but obviously that's the like the ultimate is when we can actually build proper workflows for content management. Drupal's great at content management, but it's also really technical. Like that's a whole task in and of itself is like teaching people how to use Drupal content management. Um, and then you look at you know stuff like you know Tumblr or you know even WordPress in certain ways. Um, you know they have slightly better user experience. We can you know we can add a theme, we can format our forms in Drupal, we can do all sorts of stuff to beautify it. Um, but, you know, the fundamental failings of Drupal are in, you know, telling stories or, you know, um, providing really narrow user experience um, or content management user experiences. Um, we had a conversation with a client the other day and they were talking about, um, they had this, you know, really complicated matrix in their RFP um, for permissions. You know, they're like, we have these users that want to be able to edit this kind of content on this specific page and this, this, this. So with Drupal, we can install like, you know, 10 layers of permissions to like, you know, make a block on a page, um, you know, editable. Um, but if you're doing sort of this decoupled, uh, you know, content management interface, you could just build an interface just for that person. You know, I mean, maybe not that narrow, but like just for that role. So if you have one person or like 10 people at an organization that only edit one type of content, why would you give them access to the Drupal content management experience, right? Just give them a really simple portal they can log into and edit that one thing. Um, so anyways, and ideally they can also do that directly on the front end. It goes through a publishing workflow. So anyways. Just to expand on that idea, even uh, when it comes to content management or adding or editing content, it doesn't necessarily even have to be personal, right? No, exactly. It can, well, that's, you know, we've got external APIs that can feed into Drupal right. through the API. That model, like externalizing the content management or the content editing crud kind of system, um, that further segments that team that I was talking about yep. before, right? So now you have concepts of like a uh, content manager may work in Drupal, and then the information architect works in Drupal directly, mm -hmm. whereas the actual contributors are working. And in some Angular front end. Exactly. Yep. Somewhere else that's very much tailored towards. Yep. 
their particular role and need. Well, there's also a lot of third-party stuff for that too, right? Like if your data model is, um, if your Drupal data model is agnostic enough, you could have like, this could be like contentful, um, you know, stuff like that, like, you know, like gather content, I guess, that kind of stuff. Like where they have APIs, there's a, a tool called import.io that's really good for like just scraping data from wherever and building an API off of it. You know, like there's all kinds of ways that you can have these external APIs that pull stuff in and that make their way into Drupal and then make their way out to whatever it is that's on the end. One alternative uh, mechanism we use to avoid bootstrapping Drupal all the time, mm -hmm. we write a lot of uh, mobile applications. Mm -hmm. uh, we basically use Drupal to hash data, to create data, and store it to Couchbase. Mm -hmm. And we query Couchbase directly. Mm -hmm. So with Drupal, it can just create the document. Right, right. Sorry, that's CouchDB, is that you, what you said? Or? Couchbase. OK, I'm not familiar with that. It's a very same idea. Uh, the only difference is that you have a very good HTTP interface. That's OK. To begin with. OK, cool. Um, and the normal performance. Great, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, there's tons of solutions. I think, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's all about what you want to use Drupal for, right? Um, if you actually, you know, you, if the Drupal content management um, interface is your value, Great. If it's the fact that you get an API out of the box with, you know, like a, a strong MySQL-based database out of the box, great. You know, it fits in in so many different ways. Um, it's uh, just about seeing, um, you know, how you want to do it for a given project. So the keynote talked a lot about open source. Um, mm -hmm. So as we decouple Drupal, have you ensured that the open source content management system that's plugged into Drupal is also Espousing similar um, values, or are you like creating a proprietary software that sets you apart? No, so I mean, it, uh, like for what we're doing internally, um, you know, obviously the goal is to open source it. Um, you know, a, a commitment to open source technology is like you know critical if you're going to take advantage of something like Drupal, right? Like, ideally, you're contributing. If you're not, then like hopefully you're contributing to somewhere else. Um, I think everyone in this room probably agrees that like open source is kind of the way of the future as far as software goes. Um, or at least the way of the present, and it's awesome. Um, so <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah, I think like the goal is to use, you know, to always be open source as much as possible. I mean, obviously there's, you know, balances to that. You know, there's companies like Acquia that have, you know, a huge contributors to Drupal, but they also have their own proprietary systems that they're, that they're leveraging to, to, to make profit. So, and I don't begrudge them that. Um, that's part of the awesome thing about where open source technology is right now is that there's actually a lot of money to make around it. Um, I think the key is to make sure that, you know, if you're building something that really leverages something else, it's good to give back. And, um, you know, if you really want to build an ecosystem around something, I mean, that's like the model that made Drupal successful. Um, you know, making it open source and looking for contributors is a, or at least even just people to use the platform is a critical way to, to manage your software ecosystem. Anybody else? Great, I'll be there. Great. Awesome. Okay, thanks a lot.